let's ch move into chapter two dealing with heat exchangers. So this is an introduction to heat exchangers. There's a lot of heat exchangers and maybe I could just go through the whole host of heat exchangers and different styles and types. We'll eventually do that, but not on the first day. But here's a picture of one that we'll analyze today. It's a concentric tube or double wall pipe or pipe, you know, it's pipe, a pipe inside of a pipe. And the fluid inside the one pipe runs maybe this way and it doesn't mix with the fluid that's in the annulus that may run like this and then go out. Um, this is very similar. This is a, a shell and tube heat exchanger. So you have a shell side and then you have tubes and the tubes you can see they come in and uh, they'll split in this manifold into different tubes flow. It'll be a U-tube. Sometimes they're straight through, then they have a manifold on the back end to, to go in a straight run through the other tubes. Different designs on shell and tube heat exchangers and out you go. So fluid on the shell side and the fluid on the tube side. This is an automobile radiator. So what are our two fluids? The fluid with the uh, liquid in and out. Uh, mainly water with some antifreeze and then the air side goes across so this is a cross flow heat exchanger and then you have different these are plate type heat exchangers where uh, you can actually these are designed to take apart easily and service easily and so you'll see a lot of those they're, they're um, they're compromised between the best efficiency and the best serviceability and the best reliability and uh, expandability, you could um, long rods, bolt these together. You could take the apart and expand the heat exchanger if you needed to increase its area, make it larger. All right, the fluid flow pattern, I have other illustrations to talk about the fluid flow patterns in these heat exchangers, but not today. So let's go to the simplest heat exchanger, the concentric tube heat exchanger and think of either parallel flow or counter flow. So normally we'd sketch it something like this and say I have fluid that's on the hot fluid, flows this way, and the cold fluid flows that way. And the hot fluid and the cold fluid enter on the same side and exit on the same side, hence the flow are parallel, they're parallel. Uh, you could maybe say concurrent flow or some other terminology to say they're in the same direction. How about counter flow? And we'll have the hot side come this way and the cold side go that way. And for introductory purposes, think about a location, a coordinate system X runs from zero to L, the length of those, that heat exchanger and we'll plot the temperature on the y-axis and think about the high temperature. The temperature hot coming in is the highest temperature and the temperature of the cold coming in would be the low temperature. And what do you think the temperatures are going to do as it flows through the heat exchanger? You might expect that the hot fluid to come down some and exit at a lower temperature, temperature hot out, and the cold fluid could go up some, temperature cold out. Would it be reasonable for the cold to somehow come out at a higher temperature than the hot out? No, no. So this is not possible, true? It's just not possible. Why is that not possible? Well, what's happening is, is you discretize this into little dx's, and for every little dx, there's a little bit of heat transfer, a little bit of heat transfer. And if you had that case that I just erased, it would be like, hold it, heat is coming out of the hot fluid, which is now cooler than the cold fluid, and flowing to the higher temperature cold fluid, that's not going to work. Heat transfer always goes from what's hot to cold in a thing like this. Okay, we, we, we're not... We don't think of a complicated system to, like air conditioning system. This is just uh, fluid exposed to other fluids separated by walls. So convection and conduction heat transfer. All right. 
Um, when might we expect, if this was the case right here, and I asked you, okay, change it up a little bit, um, I start to increase the mass flow rate of the hot fluid. I really start pumping more hot fluid through the system. How does it change the red curve? Does it change the temperature of the hot coming in if I increase the mass flow rate of the hot fluid? How does that red curve, the temperature profile of the hot fluid change as it goes through the heat exchanger? Would it be either coming down steeper or would it be shallower? Shallower. Wouldn't it be shallower? And so the hot out would go up, wouldn't it? The hot out. Okay, what about the cold, the same temperature cold in? What would the cold temperature profile do? Would it change? Would the cold outlet go up or would it go down? All I did was I did not change the mass flow rate of the cold fluid or the temperature coming in of the cold fluid. All I did was increase the mass flow rate of the hot fluid. It would be a little steeper so that the temperature of the cold out actually went up a little bit? Let's vote with your thumbs. Does it look okay? All right, so that's right. Now you could play the reverse game and say, what happens if I change the mass flow rate of the cold fluid and make those sketches? I really think that's helpful. Let's do the same thing over here for the counter current. This is much more popular and we'll see why. Why would you design a heat exchanger uh, to run in this type of configuration? Well, let's put the same type of hot temperature. Whoops. But here, what do I have? On, uh, let's get black and then, all right. So over here, I have the temperature of the hot fluid in, don't I? And on this side, I have the temperature cold in. So now, describe the temperature profile. Well, you could have a temperature profile that looks something like this and something like that, so that the temperature of the hot out is, well, the temperature of the hot fluid anywhere inside the heat exchanger is always higher than the local temperature of the cold fluid, right? Okay, but as sketched, what could happen right here? The temperature, the cold out, if I did it very accurately, it could actually exceed the temperature of the hot out, couldn't it? Couldn't it? Yeah, it could. Um, uh, let me see. Could you, in the parallel flow, could you ever get the hot out lower than the cold out? No, it's impossible. But here it is possible. Okay. Um, let me ask you a little bit. Um, what happens if I make the same temperature for the hot in and the same temperature for the cold in, but I make the heat exchanger longer. I increase its length. So it's like I have to say, no, put the length over here, and here is the starting temperature, temperature hot in. True? What will, what will the temperature profile look like compared to the shorter, smaller heat exchanger? Now I have a larger heat exchanger, don't change any flow rates. The mass flow rate's the same. Fluid flow rates are the same. What would happen? The temperature difference would decrease, right? And so maybe, I know this is gonna be a complicated diagram, but it may go like this, and the blue may go like this. Maybe, something like that. Did it actually change the slope of the red line? Let's say this was the original led red line and that's the second case red line. Did it change the slope of the red line? How about this? Did it change the slope of the blue line? Case one, 
and case two. Yeah, and if you make it really long, you can see that if we would have just extrapolated that blue line up, maybe we would have got to a ridiculous case. Okay? So the slopes changed a little bit, didn't they? Both of them. All right. What, what dictated the slope? Well, there are a lot of things that dictate the slope, but I'm not going to change the mass flow rate, and I'm not going to change the specific heats of either fluid streams for this introduction right now for this part of the discussion. What, 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 makes, it, what makes the slope on the red line and the slope on the blue line? It's the temperature difference between the red line and the blue line. What is the temp local temperature difference between hot fluid and cold fluid? And because that dictates the rate of heat transfer, hence the rate of change of the hot, it's going to go down, and the rate of change of the cold, that's going to go up in, in the direction of flow. Now, that's a pretty complicated concept. <laughs> All right, but let's do this. Let's go back and, and play with it where I have not changing the length, but I had the temperature of the hot fluid coming in. I'm not going to change that, the temperature of the hot in. I'm not going to change the cold in. I'm not going to change anything with the cold fluid, but what am I going to do to the hot fluid? Make it go faster. Increase mass flow rate of the hot fluid. All right, what will the red curve do? It used to be here, the red curve, right? It used to be right here. Will it go up or will it go down or will the red curve stay the same? So if I increase the mass flow rate of the hot fluid, the red curve will go up stay the same or go down? Up. up. And you're exactly right. So that's what happens to the red curve. Okay? What about the blue curve? It used to be like this. Will the blue curve increase, you know, go up a little bit, steeper, or not? You said you were changing anything in the cold? Nothing in the cold. Nothing in the cold. It'll go up. And why would it go up a little bit? Because the delta T is a little greater to drive that heat transfer. Hence, more heat is going to get into the cold fluid. I didn't change the temperature of the hot fluid. All I did was change the mass flow rate of the hot fluid. But that was enough to do it. Um, I'm not certain how many of these, uh, I know that they're very productive and you need to process these type of questions in your mind. I, don't, I hope a lot of you are following along, but these could be very tricky. Did you have a question? On the slopes for the conflow, they're not parallel, right? That's another good question. So that now we say, what case do I have when I would expect the slopes to be pretty parallel for the hot fluid and the cold fluid. Under what conditions would that be? Somebody would say, well, probably when the mass flow rate of the hot fluid is pretty close to the mass flow rate of the cold fluid. But it's not just the mass flow rates, it's the mass flow rate times the specific heat of the hot fluid and mass flow rate times the specific heat of the cold fluid. When the product of the mass flow rates and the specific heats are the same, the slopes will be the same. That's it. And so in this heat transfer literature, we introduce a cap C symbol. And the cap C is the mass flow rate times the specific heat. I'm not doing phase change. I'm not doing condensation or, or vaporization yet. We'll get there. But for introductory purposes, it's just single phase. If it's a gas, it stays a gas. If it's a liquid, it stays a liquid. So we have a constant specific heat, neglecting temperature-dependent specific heats, and you have the mass flow rate, and you have the heat capacity rate. Heat capacity rate. All right. New term, CAPC. It's used a lot in heat exchanger literature and analysis and methods. Uh, what are the units, both SI as well as 
U.S. customary system of units for the heat capacity rate. Watts. So let's do it this way. I'll scroll down just a little bit. So we have mass flow rate specific heat. Let's work over here in SI. So we're going to have kilograms per second times kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin or degree C. Kilograms cancel. I'll have, forget the kilo, I'll have watts per degree C. True? All right, mass flow rate over in the USCS. Um, let's do pounds per minute or pounds per hour or pounds per something, second. And then specific heat. Well, that's how many BTUs per pound degree F. BTUs cancel. So we'll have BTUs per minute. That's some rate of transfer divided by degrees F. It's consistent. Isn't that consistent between them? So they do have a little funny units. It's a BTUs per minute per degree F or something like that. Uh, for this uh, M dot time T, the, the C is assumed as a C constant, right? Yes. But uh, is it built in reality or does it change with temperature? Well, with the advent of computers, uh, we can account for a variable temperature-dependent properties as it flows through our system. And so we discretize, and you can really do a good job of analysis. But for introductory purposes, it's constant. Uh, some fluids are more susceptible. Their properties change as a stronger function of temperature. So, but we're going to just use an average temperature. Think about water, liquids, or something like that, gases. So that's an idea. If, uh, if the flow rate of the mass, flow rate of the hot fluid increases, then the hot fluid curve becomes flatter. If the mass flow rate of the cold fluid increases, it becomes flatter. True? It goes down. And we already explored increasing the length. So think about increasing mass flow rates or increasing heat capacity rates. And then also um, increasing the area or length. Here's two basic questions when you're doing heat exchanger analysis. It's basically the two questions are you're going to rate the heat exchanger or you're going to size the heat exchanger. You're going to say for this heat exchanger, here it is, think about it right here. Here it is, plop it down on somebody's desk or there it is right there in the shop. What will the rate of heat transfer be with these two inlet fluids? What will Q be? What will the rate of heat, so you rate your heat exchanger by predicting what it can transfer. That's the first question. The second question is, is I know what I need to transfer in my plant. <laughs> I know I need to get this many you know, gallons per minute of this type of substance with this specific heat from this inlet temperature to that outlet temperature. Basically, it told me what I need to transfer the rate of transfer needs to be accomplished, right? The next question is, is how big should my heat exchanger be to accomplish that goal? So you size your heat exchanger. So what you're going to find is you'll find almost like version A and version B of equations in the heat exchanger in, uh, chapter. And they're going to be like, oh, if you want to rate it, use the version A. If you want to size it, version B. Maybe you recall that different set of tables in the heat transfer textbook. Well, there's two analysis methods that are out there. There's really more, many more than just two, but two have survived and are still in heat transfer textbooks. One is called the log mean temperature difference, and it's presented especially for informational purposes in this class as well as in most textbooks. Some textbooks have relegated to an appendix and it may eventually go away. But it's the effectiveness NTU method is the more predominant method uh, and is more flexible method. But when you uh, get a more flexible predominant method, it's sometimes more abstract and it's harder to understand what's going on. So in the log mean temperature difference method, you have the rate of heat transfer is some overall heat transfer coefficient in the heat exchanger 
which you may recall having to uh, work with in the pre prerequisite class, the, the overall heat transfer coefficient. A lot of times we have a, a solid separating a fluid from a fluid, and we think about having the temperature of the fluid, then we have a little convective resistance, a little conduction resistance, and a little convection resistance. So we'll have the 1 over HA on that side, the 1 over HA on that side, and the L over KA on that side, and we wrap them all together to get a, a 1 uh, over UA, which is an overall heat transfer coefficient, has the same units like H, convection coefficient. So we have that big symbol, I, I ran out of room, sorry about it, let me scoot this down a little bit. All right, so the, in the log mean temperature difference, you have the rate of heat transfer in that heat exchanger is equal to U, the overall heat transfer coefficient, times A. That gives me not only the physical size, but the thermal size of that heat exchanger, times an appropriate temperature difference. The log mean temperature difference is the appropriate temperature difference. Let's go back to these plots right here, um, or maybe I'll make a new one. So if I had a heat exchanger, and this works for parallel flow, counter flow, cross flow, all kinds of heat exchangers, you just put a correction factor in or look up a, core, a, a table to get one of the properties. Let's say the hot, uh, let me draw it like this, the hot fluid, T hot in, and the, what's down here, T cold in, the cold fluid goes like this, the hot fluid goes like that. Can you see that this temperature difference throughout the heat exchanger is roughly the same? That's the temperature difference that this log mean would give you. It would give you that value. All right, but what happens if the hot did something like this and the blue did something like that. Well, you would see that the temperature difference over here is less than the temperature difference in that part of the heat exchanger. So it's like, give me the appropriate temperature difference that is throughout the heat exchanger, and the log mean temperature difference does exactly that. Not only will it work for this counter flow, but it works for the more theoretical, less practical parallel flow where you can get some dramatic differences because what does the temperature difference look like over here? Quite large. What's the temperature difference over there? Quite small. And it'll work in those cases as well. So what is that log mean temperature difference? Well, what you do is you say, tell me the temperature difference on one side. It really doesn't matter of that heat exchanger, delta T1 difference between the hot and the cold on this side. Tell me the temperature difference between the hot and the cold on the other side, delta T2. <coughs> and if you're a student, the first time you see it, you say, well, maybe I'll just add them together and divide by two. In many cases, you wouldn't be too far off, but the accurate log mean temperature difference method would be delta T on the one side minus the delta T on the second side divided by the natural log of the delta T on one side divided by the delta T on the second side. We're going to drive that equation in a minute. I'm giving you the perspective before we get into the brutal math. All right. The next method is the effectiveness NTU method. Effectiveness often is the epsilon or some other Greek symbol for effectiveness. NTU is just like, you know, LMTD, log mean temperature difference. Is NTU is the number of transfer units. Number of transfer units. So uh, uh, the number of transfer units is just simply defined as the U, oh I forgot what was U, uh, the overall heat transfer coefficient. It accounts for the fluid convection resistance on both sides and the wall, typically conduction through it. Okay, so UA over C, hey, cap C, oh, what was that? That was a product of mass <coughs> flow rate and specific heat. What is cap C, the name of it? 
heat capacity rate. What are these funny units on it? BTUs per minute degree F or watts per degree C? And it's a product M dot C. So it's the minimum, what? C min, the minimum heat capacity rate. Well, I have two fluids. I have a hot fluid and a cold fluid. I can calculate the heat capacity rates of either one of those, and I say which one is the minimum, and that's what is used in the definition of the number of transfer units NTUs. All right, what about the effectiveness? Well, the effectiveness is a de definition Q. Wow, what was Q used for? What's the name of Q? Q is the the rate of heat transfer occurring in my heat exchanger. It's the rate of heat transfer. What would be the typical SI unit? Watt or USCS, BTUs per hour, BTUs per minute, something. It's a rate of heat transfer, right? So the effectiveness is the actual rate of heat transfer being accomplished in that heat exchanger divided by MAX. I don't I keep always confused. What does MAX stand for? The maximum possible. The maximum possible. And it takes a while to figure this out, but the, let me give you the equation, then try to explain it. The maximum theoretical possible is if I have the minimum heat capacity rate times the maximum delta T ever possible in this heat exchanger between the two fluids. The most extreme high, high temperature is the hot end. Is there a higher temperature anywhere in the system than the hot end? No. And what's the lowest temperature? Cold end. So I've got the most extreme temperature that's physically being realized times the minimum heat capacity rate. And that gives you the maximum rate of heat transfer possible. Make that heat exchanger as large as you want without changing your fluid flow rates because C min is based on comparing the hot fluid and the cold fluid heat capacity rates, right? Don't go changing C min. Think about conceptually changing the area. Let the area go long, 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 huge, long heat exchanger, right? If we let the long, long, long heat exchanger go with the high mass flow rate of the hot fluid, get rid of this one here. So this is the mass flow, yeah. this is the mass flow rate of the hot fluid is very, very high. It's nearly flat going across, right? The temperature of the hot fluid out is a little bit less than the temperature of the hot fluid in and I make this L go very, very long, so we put the little, how do they draw that line like this, saying there's a break in it, yeah, right, something like that. It's a break in it, so L is way out there. What does the blue fluid do? Will it go something like this? Where, what will the temperature of the blue fluid do going out? I have a super long. It'll go to T hot in. So you could think about making it super long and you would have the change. In this case, can you tell that the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid is less than the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid? We let the mass flow rate of the hot fluid go off to infinity to achieve this. So of course the cold fluid is less. So it's a little tricky. There's a lot of, you know, what if this, what if that, but it's the minimum heat capacity rate times the maximum temperature difference anywhere. The hot fluid in minus the cold fluid in. That's the effectiveness NTU method. That's the more practical, popular, implementable, quicker method. Well, I thought about taking a blank page, have my notes, and just start the derivation. And then I thought, hmm, I got that page, that page, and that page to cover. And I think you would be asleep by then. So let me say this. It's in every heat transfer textbook. <laughs> it is. And it's in our book, too. And the derivation, just what they do in the book is they say, and it follows such that, boom, and they have two lines, and the work between those two lines is about ten, two or three pages of work. 
So anyway, let me do this. Let me kind of guide you through this. Uh, so let's start out. We have to pick something to analyze. Concentric tube, it's easy mathematically and easy to illustrate. Counter flow, because that's the predominant way the fluids are actually flow through heat exchangers. And we want to derive for the temperature distribution, regardless if the hot fluid's flowing really fast or slow, regardless of the specific heat of the hot fluid or cold fluid or the heat capacity rates. This is going to work for all those cases. So you think for a minute, just kind of sketch a case. Put the hot in over here, the hot out, cold in, cold out. I didn't try to draw them to have the same slope. Here's an expert question. Which one of them, just by the looking at the plot, would have a slight, would have the lowest heat capacity rate? Which one would have the highest heat capacity rate? This is a really hard question. It's a product of mass flow rate times specific heat. So which one of them has the highest C, cap C? The cold. The cold does, very good. The cold fluid, because it doesn't change as much in the temperature through the heat exchanger. So it's a larger heat capacity rate. You can think about higher mass flow rate, higher mass flow rate specific heat. It's really that thermal property. Okay. We talk about, uh, we're going to talk about every little dx. So if I'm going to talk about every little dx, then I need the, really the dA that goes with it. The perimeter times the dx makes sense. So even if you don't have a perimeter, introduce a perimeter. In a concentric tube, it makes sense to have a perimeter. But uh, we're talking about the amount of heat, the small dq transferred at every little dx. Okay. So notice, mathematically, what am I writing? dH t dx. The rate of change of the hot fluid temperature as I move in the positive direction of change of x. Do you see this, what I'm trying to say right here? Is, guess what? It's positive. Don't overthink it. The fluid is flowing in the negative x direction. But when I plot the temperature, <laughs> th is a function of x. The slope is positive. Likewise, the change of the cold temperature with respect to x is also positive. They both have a positive. And I'm going to be working in the same x. x goes from 0 to L. All right. So the heat capacity rates with the units watts per degree C are shown for the cold and the hot fluid. And I look and I say, what is my rate equation to predict what this term is, dq? Because that's what controls how the temperatures change, isn't it? If it's, I can get a lot of heat transfer for the same delta T, the temperature of the hot and the temperature of the cold will more rapidly change. Isn't this my rate equation? It's a UA dt. And U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. Also, we know just if I look only at the cold fluid, the amount of heat into the cold fluid makes the temperature of the cold fluid go up. By what? Heat capacity rate times the change in the cold fluid temperature. Does this equation look sense? Make sense? This one came from our rate equation. It's basically our description of rates of heat transfer. It's a combination of convection, conduction, convection. Combination of Newton's, Fourier's, Newton's law. What is this second one? It's not Newton's, it's not Fourier's law. What is it? Ooh, it just landed on the sheet of paper, I don't know. It looked good, it looked like it was sensible to write down. No, 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 what's the basis for it? Genius. If I give them a little A plus, a little star, you know, walk around and like kindergarten, put a little star on the paper. That's all you have to do to make me happy. Been the same thing in thermal one, thermal two, heat transfer, now thermal systems design. Professor, the answer to the question is the first law of thermodynamics. <laughs> You're right. Isn't it? It is. And guess what? For those that want to show off now, let's take a look at DQ and what its effect on the hot fluid stream. Burst law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. I transfer heat in to the system, and there's now going to be increase in the temperature of that flowing fluid. All right. We combine now this equation 
We get rid of the del Qs. We put the rate on both sides, here, here. Now I have two equations. I want to combine them. If you never did this before, you would say, I don't know which way you're going. Well, trust me, let's start driving to Houston, but I got to first get on UTSA Boulevard, then I got to get on I-10, then I got to turn here, right? It's like somebody else did this before. <laughs> and so you combine them this way, algebraically, it's just algebra, and you get this equation, and it's starting to look like changes in temperature difference proportional to change in location, dx. Ah, I'm getting a differential equation. And then I recall at x equal to zero, the dt dc is equal to dh out minus d cold in. I could do it and have done it for the parallel flow. Let's do it for the counter flow. It's a little more tricky with the counter flow conceptually. The parallel flow is probably what most texts do anyway. But you then integrate from x equal to zero to a arbitrary x. You know the initial condition at x equal to zero. And you get this equation. Look at it. The temperature hot minus temperature cold at that location, at that location x in our counterflow concentric tube heat exchanger is equal to Th out minus T cold in over at x equal to zero times, and I couldn't fit it on one line, the exponential of 1 over CH minus 1 over C cold all times UPx. It's a function of x. It's an exponential function of x. You can play a game. You can explore the solution. This is tricky. I'm sorry, but this is just what heat exchanger analysis is. If the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid is greater than the heat capacity rate of the cold hot fluid, then look at it. The temperature difference, the local temperature difference, equal to a theta initial at the knot at coming in, ex exponent of something that's positive. That's the key. Positive times x. So what's going to happen to the temperature difference as I move an increasing x? It opens up, doesn't it? It opens up. And then if you say, OK, what about the hot fluid being greater than the cold fluid? Then if I look up here, that term is now negative. I have e to the negative x. What does that do with increasing x? And theta decreases as I move. It gives me the, both the same, it gives me the right shapes, doesn't it? In the limit, as C cold and C hot equal each other, I have E to the 0x. It's constant temperature difference through the heat exchanger. I didn't lose you yet. Now that we have the temperature difference anywhere in the heat exchanger as a function of x, we can derive the log mean temperature uh, method. OK. So you just say, well, don't stop at x. Take it all the way to L. So if you evaluate the same equation we had it all the way to L, isn't this the temperature hot in minus cold out equal to what was that x equal to 0 times e to the minus everything here? I put p times L. That's a. So I have ua. I went the whole area. Now you just. Uh, do the algebra, and you recall that the C sub H can be replaced by Q over the temperature difference of, or the temperature change experienced by the hot fluid as well as the heat capacity rate of cold is Q divided by the temperature change of the cold fluid. You put that in, you're doing some algebra, and lo and behold, you get Q is equal to UA times a big blob, and you call that the log mean temperature difference. So that big log mean temperature difference can be read as talk about the temperature difference on one side, the temperature difference on the other side. And it doesn't matter which one you put. It can be dt1 minus dt2 divided by natural log of dt1 over dt2, or dt2 minus dt1, does it? These equations, it's like, hold it. Which one is right, the one on the left or the one on the right? They're the same. How is that true? Do this. I have the natural log of A over B. How is that related to the natural log of B over A? How is that related? How is the natural log of A over B related to the natural log of B over A? It's a negative sign. 
And so what happens is you can flip this in the denominator, put the negative sign, and then you change up on the top. That's all. So there you go. That's a log mean temperature difference. It works great if you know the temperatures of the fluids in and out. It's more challenging. It leads to an iterative solution or approach when you don't know the outlet temperatures, but you're asked to calculate them. You kind of have to guess what is the outlet temperature so that I can get an estimate of the delta T log mean, to get an estimate of Q, to get an estimate of the outlet temperatures, to go back and correct, and it leads to an iterative solution. It's not bad. It's accurate. It's very accurate. The next method is the effectiveness NTU method. We had a brief introduction. Well, what you can do is you say, okay, the genius that thought this up was truly a genius. I don't know who it was originally. Somewhere I should research it, right? And then we should, put, we should replace it and put their name. The Joneses method, right? And honor Jones, whoever did it. So we, uh, we know all of our heat capacity rates. At this point in the analysis, it's easier if you just pick one to be the dominant heat capacity rate. The other will be the... But if you did this twice and you switched it and said, no, don't let cold be the greater than the hot, let the hot be greater than the cold, you'll get the same exact result. But it's easier to just pick one and say, this is the relative uh, difference between them. Okay, so we're just picking that one. So the effectiveness is Q max, Q over Q max. So the minimum, in this case, in general, it's the minimum of the cold and hot, but for this case, it's gonna be the hot fluid is the minimum heat capacity rate. Hence, the de definition of NEN to use is UA over C min. In this case, it would be UA over CH. Then we have Q max. It's typically, in general, C min times this temperature difference. Now it's gonna be CH times that temperature difference. And then the actual rate of heat transfer unraveling the effectiveness will be the effectiveness times the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid times the temperature difference. Is this exciting? I see one big yawn. Are we following this? Would it have been helpful if I would have pretended that I didn't have my notes and impress you that I'm able to drive it? It would take 20 minutes longer. Okay, let's slug through, Professor. Get the pill, take the pain, you know. <laughs> so we have the hot fluid out as the cold fluid, the hot fluid in minus the how much heat is transferred, the rate of heat transfer, divided by the CH. So the hot fluid out is equal to, what is Q? Replace it right here. Put that in there, the CH is cancel. Kind of like a little bingo. Oh, look at that. And we can say, well, delta T2 is T hot out. Uh, I'm sorry, T hot out minus T cold in. And I can replace what is T cold in. Uh, right here, I just put that into this one into here. Do the algebra, and I get delta T2 on one of the sides is T hot in minus T cold in times 1 minus epsilon, the effectiveness. This, what I just did here, needs to be done again, focusing on the cold, and you get delta T1 is equal to T hot in minus T cold out without any effectiveness. Okay, algebra on those. Now, uh, I'm sorry, this one gets delta T1 after you substitute for T cold out right here, you have to substitute, you get this long equation for delta T1. You recall the log mean temperature difference? Stick in delta T1, delta T2, delta T1, delta T2. They expand. You look for things to cancel. You only find that to cancel. You now know that Q is equal to UA log mean temperature difference. So you have the whole log mean temperature difference put in. I know that Q max divided by C min times T hot in minus T cold in, that all in blue is, I just multiplied by unity. I just multiplied by one. That way I can get the definition of the number of transfer units. I can cancel um, 
the effectiveness times Q max is equal to Q, so all those three red lines cancel, and these delta T's, one of them set cancel, and here is the final result. The number of transfer units is equal to 1 over 1 minus CR, the ratio of heat capacity rates minimum over maximum, times the natural log, 1 minus the effectiveness ratio of heat capacity rates divided by 1 minus, and you put a little star there, and you say, oh, we did it. So if I'm interested in knowing, if I need to size it, I use that first equation because NTU, area is embedded in NTU. If I need to size it. You can rewrite that same equation with effectiveness on one side. That's the second equation. And then everything else is on the other side. So if I know the area and I want to know the actual amount of heat transfer, then I would get the effectiveness and then use that to get the actual Q. So you use this second equation to rate and you use the first equation to size the heat exchanger. They're the same equation. They're the same equation. They're mathematically the same. All right. Do I have enough time to solve a problem? Water enters a counterflow concentric tube heat exchanger at 150 pound mass per minute. So our heat exchanger is going to be like this, and I'm going to divide it like that, and let's just do the hot fluid on one side, and we'll put the cold fluid on the other side. And the water enters, it's going from 60 degrees to 140. Is the water the cold fluid or the hot fluid? The temperature of the cold in is 60 degrees F, not the C and it goes out, temperature cold out is 140 degrees F. True? It's the cold fluid. Water's the cold fluid. And so we have the, the mass flow rate of the cold fluid is 150 pounds per minute. They didn't tell me the specific heat of water. It's about one pound, BTU per pound degree F. That's specific heat of water. You would get that out of the table or, or just remember it. What's doing the heating? So the water is the colder fluid. Oil is the hot fluid. It comes in temperature hot in of 240 degrees F. And they tell you the temperature of the hot out is equal to 80 degrees F. Notice that the oil comes out lower temperature than the water goes out. Make sense? Yeah. And the oil has a specific heat. Let me put it over here. Uh, specific heat of the hot fluid is 0.48 BTUs per pound mass degree F. The overall heat transfer coefficient is 52.8 BTU per hour per foot squared degree F. What information did they just give us there? Cap U. That's right. 52.8 etc. What's the question? Determine the heat transfer area. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to rate it or size it? Size it, yeah. Determine the heat transfer area. We're going to use the effectiveness NTU method. How are we going to solve this problem? Think in general that I'm going to eventually get NTU equal to some function of effectiveness and CR, ratio of heat capacity rates. Once I get the number of transfer units, then I recall that the number of transfer units is UA over C min, and so the area is the number of transfer units times C min divided by U. So I got to get the number of transfer units, then unravel it. It's like, it's a dimensionalist ratio, isn't it? Is it NTU dimensionless? It's purely dimensionless. Yeah. So, okay, well, I need to get the effectiveness. Well, how am I going to get the effectiveness? Well, actually, can I calculate Q actual? What is the rate of heat transfer that occurs in the seat exchanger? Sure. You would say either from the perspective of the cold fluid which has a heat capacity rate of 150 BTUs per 
minute degree F, or the hot fluid. They don't give us the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid, do they? But can they, is, is this equal to the cold fluid times the temperature of the cold out minus temperature of the cold in? It's conservation of energy, the cold fluid underwent this change, mass flow rate of the cold is given, heat, the specific heat of the cold is given. So we calculate the Q and there's 12,000 BTUs per minute. Well, if there's 12,000 BTUs per minute getting into the water, where is it coming from? The oil. And if it's coming from the oil, then what we say is what comes out of the oil goes into the water, so it's 12,000. So the Q is equal to the C of the hot times the temperature of the hot in minus temperature of the hot out. True? I do a little check. I just calculated the Q. I have the two temperatures of the hot fluid. I can get the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid. The heat capacity rate of the hot fluid is calculated to be 75 BTUs per minute degree F. Do a quick comparison. Which one is the minimum? So C min is of the hot and it's 75 BTU per minute degree F. I'm going to need this C sub R. What is C sub R? The ratio of minimum to maximum. So what's the minimum? 75. What's the maximum? 150. It comes out to 0 0.50. It's half. C sub R is a half. Okay. Now, uh, I know Q. Uh, what I really need, and I just calculated C sub R right here, and I if I get the effectiveness, then I can just plug it into my equation to calculate the number of transfer units. Well, what equation am I going to plug into? Either version A or version B. Which equation? Yeah, we're going to B. We want to get NTUs. So we're going to stick it into that second uh, uh, version B. I said B is that, that equation right there. That's our road map. Okay, so I need to get the effectiveness, but how do I get the effectiveness? I need to get the maximum possible. What is that? C min times temperature hot in minus temperature cold in. And so the maximum rate of heat transfer is 13,500 BTUs per min. So the effectiveness is what I actually get divided by the maximum. It's 12,000 divided by 13,500. It comes in at 0 0.8889, 89%, close to 90%, a little bit under 90%. We know the effectiveness, the NTUs. We use that equation. The NTU is equal to, and I'll just rewrite it, natural log of 1 minus the effectiveness times the ratio of heat capacity rates divided by 1 minus effectiveness divided by 1 minus C sub R. When you do that, the number of transfer units comes in at 3.2189. Are there any units with that? None. It's dimensionless. But when we unravel it up here to get the area, We'll multiply by C min, we'll divide by cap U, the overall heat transfer coefficient, and we calculate the area to be 274 square feet. It's a large area. Does that look good? Guess what I like to do? We solve a problem, but then we turn it around and change it up just a little bit, and so I'm ready to ask you for a change. So the same wording up here, instead of saying something about the, uh, the uh, sizing it, we say, no, what we're going to do is the water flow rate is going to change. It used to be 150. used to be 150 pounds per minute. We're now going to change it to 110 pounds per minute. What did the mass flow rate of the water do? went down. Now, 
right away, the temperature of the water going out, we have to relax. And the temperature of the oil going out, we have to relax because, hey, that's, we just changed an input. In a real system, I changed one of those, the mass flow rate of the cold fluid. The area, the size has not changed. So I'm going to stay with my area to be 274 foot squared. This is really just like you might think. Hey, I size that piece of equipment, and you guys in the plant, you just change the flow rates. <laughs> of course now our outlet temperatures are different than what I told you they would be because you changed my inlet flow rates. You've got to put it back to where I told you, right? Something like that. You can see this dialogue playing out. Well, before I go through the brute force calculation of what is the new exit water temperature, the temperature of the cold fluid outlet, I want to ask you a few questions. Don't get psyched out. But these are the type of questions which are really hard to answer. Given that problem, just set it up. All we did was same size, we got the size, now somebody's reduced the flow rate of the cold fluid, the water through the system. Will Q change? Will the temperature of the cold on the outlet change? Will the temperature of the hot on the outlet change? Will the effectiveness change? Will the number of transfer units change? And will C ratio change? You're getting from very physical to abstract, aren't we? Let's handle the Q first, huh? Or which one is easiest? The temperature of the cold fluid out is probably the easiest. It used to come in at 60 and go out at 140, but this was now changed to 110. What happens to the outlet temperature of the cold fluid? It was 140. Is it going to go up? Is it going to be now 150? Is it going to go down or is it going to remain the same? The temperature of the cold fluid on the outlet. You say up, 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 up. All right. So let me see if I have the numbers here. It'll go up to 164 degrees F. All right. Now that we have that one correctly answered, let's take a look at this one. The temperature of the hot fluid on the outlet, it was 80. It was 80. How about if I do this? And so I, I want to really get everybody to answer this question. So I'm going to pause and walk around. Well, maybe this wasn't the easiest question. Isn't this not possibly a little easier? Let's go solve this problem. So the water went from 60 to uh, 140, but now it went from 60 to 164 degrees F. This is the new case because of the lower flow rate. What did the Q change? Because isn't Q equal to the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid times the temperature change of the cold fluid and isn't the temperature change greater than it was before? Isn't it also Q is equal to the heat capacity flow rate of the hot fluid times the temperature change of the hot fluid. Now the, the, it, it came in 80 and it used to go out, I'm sorry, it came in 240 and it used to go out 80. It's still coming in 240 so this has to go lower than 80. Did the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid change? It went down. So what happened to the actual Q? This went up, yeah, but this went down more. And so you almost have to slug to the numbers. Instead of getting 12,000 BTUs per minute, you only got 11,457 BTUs per minute. And if you only get 11,500 instead of 12,000, 12, what happens here? It comes out at 87 degrees F. All right. All right, how about the effectiveness? It used to be almost 90%. 
Well, you have to work with these things, and it goes down to about 85%. And then what about the number of transfer units? It was 3.22. Well, what's the definition of number of transfer units? UA over C min. Did the length of the heat exchanger change or the area change? No. Did the U change? No, same U. How about the minimum heat capacity rate? Well, the minimum was either from the cold fluid or the hot fluid. The hot fluid last time gave us the minimum, true. It was 75. The cold fluid was 150, but with the new flow rate, it's 110. Which one's the minimum? It's still the hot. So guess what did not change? The number of transfer units did not change. And then what about the ratio of heat capacity rates? It was 0 0.5. 0 0.5 was the uh, 75 over 150, but now it's 75 over 110. What's happened to the heat capacity rate? Nudged up a little bit, isn't it? So it increased. Here it is on plots because these are the equations we were using, and they're pretty abstract. But here it is in a plot. We had the first case in light blue where it was 3.22 for the number of transfer units. And the ratio of min to maximum was 0.5. So there's the curve of 0.5. It's right where that blue dot is. We read off the effectiveness. It's right around 90%, a little bit low, lower than 90%, 89%, right? We changed it. What happened? We t slowed down the cold fluid. The ratio of heat capacity rates went 1110, whoops, 75 over 1110, which goes a little bit higher, almost 0.7. Well, they don't have 0.7, so you interpolate between the line of 0.5 and 0.75. So there's my interpolation for the heat capacity rate of 0.68. The same number of transfer units, what did the effectiveness do? Dropped a little. So you can see it on plots as well as work it out in equations. Okay, I think I'm done with my time. Sorry, I didn't slug through that one numerically, but I gave you the answers. Did I not? So the answer is, it's, that's the change. That's the change. It goes from 80 to 87 degrees F. It goes from 89 to 85%. Stays the same, no change. And uh, this one changes from 0.5 to what, 0.6, what does I say, 8, 0.68, 0.68. Thank you very much.